Hi, I'm Tina Ramirez, and I'm so excited to be with everybody today and to introduce you to Jenny Yang. She is the Senior Vice President of Advocacy and Policy at World Relief, and someone I've known for many years, I, I mean, maybe two decades now. So uh, beginning in my earliest days in Washington, D.C., working for probably the U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom, I guess, when, when uh, she was working on refugee issues, and there was... I mean, gosh, I think at the time that was when Rabia Kadir came over. And so I'm sure that was an issue you guys were following. And then um, we had the Iraqi refugee crisis and so many other things that just kind of <laughs> came at us. So it's really exciting to have Jenny with us. And uh, Jenny has uh, been an advocate in refugee issues for over two decades. She's really at the forefront on this issue. And there's something I want her to share about, which is the Refugee Council in the United States, which is a coalition of a lot of different organizations that work on refugee issues that she's been a member of and a, and a leading member of. And so I love to, for her to just share her perspective from being a member of the Refugee Council as well. And then uh, a couple years ago, she published the second edition of her book, Welcoming the Stranger, Justice, Compassion, and Truth in the Immigration Debate. That was published in 2019 and originally in 2009. And man, in a decade, I'm sure she's been able to see a lot of changes. And so I look forward to hearing about that as well. But Jenny, thank you so much for being with us. Well, Tina, it is so great to be with you and spend some time with you talking about issues that I know we both care about. And I do remember the times when you were on the Hill and uh, working at the commission and us just constantly talking back and forth about what we can do together to advocate for people that were being persecuted. And so it's still an ongoing issue and we'll talk about that today, but it, it is really good to connect again and and to, to talk about what we both care about. Well, when I did my human rights degree, my, my second master's was, was in human rights. And I remember um, one of the courses I took was on refugee policy. And I, and I like every, they would give us all these really difficult scenarios. Like, what would you do if this happened? And could they come in? Could they not come in? And how would you navigate it? And so I, I think I had like trial by fire, <laughs> like understanding this. And then when I went to the commission, you know, with the Iraq war, there was just so many issues. Um, all of these groups were being persecuted and coming in and that was post 9-11. And so, um, you know, we were just talking about how like one of the biggest issues coming out of 9-11 were all of these these terrorism related inadmissibility grounds. So people that were severely persecuted for their faith um, and were unable to get through and, and find refugee uh, refuge outside of uh, their countries or in the United States because the U.S. had imposed all of these different um, new restrictions that literally prevented the very people we were trying to serve from coming to the United States. And so, yeah, I want to talk about all of this and how we overcame a lot of obstacles and challenges, but the ones that still exist. And, and you know, these are things that a lot of people don't get to see kind of the inside uh, track on how refugee policies are made, why they're so important and how it affects uh, people that we care a lot about. So um, just share a little bit with me to get started. How in the world did you get involved in this space? Of, <laughs> because you, I mean, it's, it's a, you are like you've worked in this one issue area like I have in religious freedom for so long and and it's it's so vital. So what inspired you to get involved in this? Well, I think it, it was part of my family story because uh, when I was little, uh, my dad, I knew that he was orphaned during the Korean War and he had immigrated to the U.S. and he wasn't a refugee, but he had experienced war and conflict as, at his very little, um, as a young child. So um, his dad was actually part of the media in Korea. And so his dad was killed when he was only three years old. And they lived with his mother and his mother became really six when my dad was seven and she passed away. So when my dad became orphaned at the age of seven and he experienced the Korean war. And so he always wanted to leave. And so he immigrated to the US. He was sponsored by a Ford Motor Company. And for 30 years, he never returned to Korea because not only did he not have any siblings or parents, but he had terrible memories of what it was like to grow up in wartime. And so it wasn't until uh, maybe about 10 years ago that he first went back to Korea, um, but it was a, almost like a heartbreaking experience for him to, to go back to the country where he experienced so much suffering. Um, and so I always knew that story of my, of my dad growing up. Um, and so so I was really kind of impacted by, by my dad's story, but I never thought I would work in the refugee field until I, I actually was in college. I was studying abroad. I was studying international relations, thinking I was going to go 
I didn't know actually what I was going to do, but um, I studied abroad in Spain and I remember uh, riding the subway and there was this young African mother and her child and a group of young Spanish teenagers came on, pulled out graffiti, uh, spray paint cans and started graffitiing all over the walls of the, the subway train, um, get out of my country, black people in Spanish. And I saw that and I immediately looked at this young African mother and her child. You could tell that she had noticed what was going on and she didn't she looked vulnerable and she obviously was bothered by it. And so no one was saying anything. And so I, I actually went up to this mother, I stood close to her and I asked her, you know, are you okay? And she didn't want to talk to me. And these group of Spanish teenagers just got off the station at the, at, um, at the next station. And what struck me about that situation was not only that there was such a blatant instance of racism happening in front of my eyes, but that no one on that train had bothered to say anything. They didn't say anything to the teenagers. They didn't say anything to this young mother. And so after that, I really started to think, well, what would it look like for this woman to feel some kind of security or some sense of welcome or inclusion in this country where she was in? Um, and, I, and I realized that from that experience that it really had to be at two levels because she needed probably legal security where she, she needed a visa or some kind of legal way for her to stay in Spain if she was seeking asylum there. Um, but the other support that she needed was really at the communal level. So if she has a legal visa and she she's granted asylum in Spain, but everyone in, around her is telling her she doesn't belong and she's experiencing racial epithets all the time, then she's not gonna feel that sense of belonging. And so it's important for anyone who's fleeing persecution to really find a sense of legal and practical structural welcome as well as communal welcome from the local society. So that summer, I actually volunteered at the UN studying asylum laws, um, but I also actually volunteered at a local anti-racism organization called SOS Racismo, which basically combats racism all throughout Europe. And we were organizing rallies and educational events. And it was really through those two pronged experiences that really, when I came back, led me to want to continue working in the space of of refugees and immigration. And so I actually worked in politics for a little bit. Um, I did political consulting. I loved it in the beginning. And then I didn't like it after I spent, you know, 16 hour days working all day on Saturdays, traveling all over Maryland with my clients. Um, and then at that point, my friend who worked at World Belief said, hey, you should apply for a job here. I think you'd be great. And so I did. And I had no idea that World Belief worked with refugees, but when I found out, I knew that was exactly what I wanted to do. And it really opened many doors for me to uh, get my feet wet and now be in the space for, for over 10 years, 20 years now. Um, and it's been a passion of mine over, over, the, over that time. That's so amazing. I, I mean, I think we could recount story after story like that, but not just in Spain, but in our own country, sadly, mm. where people are often attacked and told, you know, get out, you're not from here, you shouldn't be here. Um, a couple of years ago at Hardwired, I was, we were trying to get young people engaged and we were asking them, go around and talk to people that you meet about their stories. Because people that I meet across the country so often, it's fascinating to me that, you know, they, they look American, Americanized, whatever you want to call it. But when you ask them their background and their stories, you learn that either they or their families often came here because they were persecuted and they were fleeing some kind of oppression. And so I remember being in a Target recently and there was a man there and I'm like, I bet he's from Sudan. And I asked him, oh, where are you from? He's like, Sudan. I'm like, are you from Darfur? And he said, yes. And I just was asking him a story because the reality is all around us, people have come here for one reason or another, um, often because of persecution. And I, I mean, you can share in your own family history. I know in my own family history, it's, it's no different. My um, family fled from the Czech Republic, uh, you know, during, during the war. And so came through Ellis Island and, you know, this is just part of the American story. And, and it's important for us to remember that, um, but, but we see it all around us. So can you share a little bit? Cause I think people don't often know there are many reasons that people become refugees and um, there's five in particular. I think it'd be great for you to just share what those are because you don't just become a refugee for any reason. There's actually like specific like kind of legal framework for this of like, you no, know, you are a legitimate refugee because. Can you share what that looks like? Yeah, so to be a refugee, you you can't be fleeing generalized violence or, 
or poverty, um, you have to be facing specific persecution based on five grounds, which is your race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. So um, it's based on one of these grounds that is really almost immutable in terms of your beliefs or your race or nationality that become the reasons why people are trying to harm you. And so you have, right now we're facing the world's worst displacement crisis where around 80 million people are forcefully displaced from their homes. That's the highest number since World War II, which means that there are more people displaced now than there were right after the World War. And so you see places like Syria and Venezuela and Yemen and now Ethiopia, where because of uh, conflict, people are being forced to flee from their homes. And when you meet a lot of refugees, you understand that many of them never wanted to be a refugee. And for many of them, even a lot of people from Syria, they never thought this, the Syrian war would be entering into its 10th year now. But a lot of them thought after a couple of years, even even a, a few months, that they would be able to return back home. So I've met refugees that still have the keys to their homes because they thought they would be able to go back. And now that they, they're refugees for now almost eight or nine years in some cases, um, it's really challenging for them to even think of the possibility of what it will look like to go back home because their homes have been destroyed and there's really nothing to go back to. And so for a lot of refugees around the world, the question is, you know, where do I truly belong and where can I truly get a sense of security? And there's estimates, according to the UN, that some refugees will, on average, live in a refugee camp for 17 years. And so for a lot of kids that are born into camps, this is all they know. And a camp is not a place where you want to be long-term or short-term. It is temporary. You live in you know, small shelters. You depend on outside agencies for food and water in a lot of cases. And the, the, the dignity of work oftentimes is taken away when refugees are, are fleeing because you go into another country seeking asylum. And a lot of times you can't work in those countries. And you, if you live in a camp, you oftentimes can't leave the camp. And so, you know, that experience robs a lot of individuals of their dignity. And so I think a lot of the work we've been trying to do at World Relief and other humanitarian organizations is how do you provide dignity and relief for many refugees who oftentimes will not be able to go back home in the near future. And it's more about meeting their humanitarian needs. And it's actually about looking holistically, structurally at, well, what can we do as a community to provide welcome? And the United States has actually traditionally been the world leader when it comes to resettling refugees, which is a very uh, small, durable solution for, for refugees overall. But um, it is a, an important avenue of protection we've provided that has garnered bipartisan support over many years um, that we need to continue to preserve. But for the large majority of refugees, oftentimes they will be a refugee for many years and not be able to go home or, or locally integrate for the long term. Well, and this is really important for people to understand because when we think about refugee policy, we often think of um, the, the immigrants that are coming into our country versus there's, like you said, 80 million. Uh, I think, you know, it's an it's a it's a huge number um, when you think of just how many people around the world are li literally forced out of their homes and unable to return, and about what is it around 100,000 on average pre-Trump administration were being admitted to the United States. Is that about right? So it's a drop in the bucket. Um, and then that's just refugees that are in, immigrating to the United States. That's not all the other immigrants that are able to come to the United States. So it's a really small percentage of people that actually do get to have a, um, a durable solution outside through refugee you know, placement in another country. It's not um, but for the vast majority, they're in these countries where they're stuck um, for years. I, I remember traveling to Western Sahara, which I think has the largest permanent refugee camp in the world um, in the camps outside of, you know, outside of Morocco. And it, to me, it's just it was mind boggling seeing these camps that have just become permanent fixtures and no solution. And these are people that, you know, want to return home, want to um, continue on with their lives, but political and other issues prevent them from doing it. So, um, you know, my work has always been in how do we make communities safe so that people don't have to flee so they can go home. And this is always a last resort, as you said. But unfortunately, when it does become that last resort, uh, it's unfortunate that it's become so politicized. So tell me a little bit about your book, Welcoming the Stranger, and just what, you know, what the response has been here in the United States to, to refugees and, and how you've approached that. 
Yeah, so you're exactly right in that the U.S. has played a leadership role, but uh, this U.S. still resettles la- less than half of 1% of the world's refugees. So we still resettle only a very, very small number, even though we resettled the, the largest number in the world, generally speaking. And so um, I think the challenge for us at World Relief has co- been continuing to educate the broader public about uh, why we should be a welcoming community and what these refugees, what their lives are like and what we as a community can do to respond. And so when you look at the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program, it was actually enacted by Congress in 1980 um, unanim- unanimously in, this, in, in the Congress. So they actually passed this bill called the Refugee Act of 1980, which established the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Program. And at World Relief, we have an interesting story because the reason we got involved in with the government in being a partner with them in this program is because there was um, Evelyn and Grady Magnum were former missionaries that had lived many years in Vietnam. And when they were retiring, they came back to the U.S. and a lot of the people they knew um, and were ministering to as missionaries in Vietnam were now fleeing and now coming into the U.S. And so they said, we're missionaries. And you know, we helped them over there. Now we can help them over here. And so they work with the government to establish the program. Um, and so, and Evelyn remembers having like shoe boxes of refugees. She, she recalls where she would like lay her hands and pray over this box of refugees, get called from the government and like calling all these churches in the community, asking them to pick up refugees at the airport. And now it's, it's a little bit more systematized and professionalized than shoe boxes of refugees. But this idea of, 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 um, not just the, these vulnerable refugees coming, but the community response, of, especially of faith communities that were welcoming refugees and continue to welcome refugees to this day is an important part of that story. Because it really is a public-private partnership where um, the government selects and vets these individuals, but it's really our work through local churches and faith communities um, that are really welcoming and wanting these refugees to come. And so we do have partners with, with pastors and local congregations that are wanting and, and really at the front lines of picking refugees up, setting up their apartments, and just befriending many of these refugees that oftentimes don't know anyone when they get here. But the broader part of that is, well, how do you continue to sustain that welcome on a community, on a societal level, and on a policy level? And part of that has been educating the broader um, U.S. communities about who a refugee is, why they're fleeing persecution, and what we can do um, as a community to respond. And for us at, at World Relief, we are a, a faith-based organization. So a lot of that is tied to the biblical teaching and 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 sharing the, the context of migration throughout scriptures and how Jesus was a refugee and how you see God really using migration to fulfill his missional purposes here on earth. So that's an aspect of this conversation that we often talk about as well. But I think it's really important for people to remember that not only do we in the US have a history of immigration, you shared your family story, I shared my family story, all of us, unless we're Native American or, or even we're forced here as slaves, have some kind of migration story oftentimes in, in our family. But to remember that and to really continue to preserve that story, historic part of our country's identity um, and remember that some of the greatest Americans have been people who have been refugees because when you come here, you have this entrepreneurial spirit, you know what democracy, the value of democracy, because oftentimes you didn't experience that overseas. Um, and to the resilience of these individuals is really what the American spirit is all about. And so I think oftentimes you were talking about the Iraq war and how many people were fleeing and, and you were working and responding to that. And I think a lot of times people conflate the victims of terrorism with the perpetrators of terrorism, thinking, oh, we're, you know, resettling people from these really conflict prone areas, they're going to come in and harm us. Um, when in fact, refugees are the, are the victims of terrorism, they're not the perpetrators of terrorism. And so we have to get that that clear, um, but also recognizing that in the 40 year history of the U.S. refugee resettlement program, there hasn't been a single refugee we resettled that has taken the life of an American in a terrorist attack. So the over three million refugees means that the government has been doing a superb job in vetting these individuals. Um, but I think, you know, the question for us is, do we want to continue to welcome these individuals? Um, and can we continue to be a part of that story, especially now when over many administrations, you see a recommitment back to this program and a desire to really elevate the refugee ceiling to the historic low it is right now, which is 15,000, to a more historically average number, which has normally been around 95,000 refugees per year. 
uh, when we talk about refugees, I, I think that it's um, interesting to just look back on like history. So I remember when I first started working in Congress, um, probably the biggest refugee community historically at that point that we were kind of still talking about was the were the lost boys of Sudan because that was still such a huge issue with um, looking at the peace agreement in Sudan and trying to be, bring peace to this this country but that they, they had been so um, so ravaged by a dictatorship um, that affected everybody from you know the Africans in Darfur the African Muslims in Darfur to Christians and animists in the south and Anyway, and so the Lost Boys, I had met many of them over the years, and uh, they just, these were children that had been forced from their homes that the United States took and, and resettled, and it, they have gone on to do amazing things in our country from playing base, basketball to, you know, um, writing books and, and building businesses and just influencing their communities uh, just in so many unique ways, and then I, I remember traveling when I was working for the US Congress to Myanmar, Burma at the time. Um, and I traveled illegally across the border and um, met some of the communities there. There were this, there was like a small refugee camp just outside of outside of Burma that I met all these children that um, groups in the United States were there helping, aiding because they couldn't leave. I mean, they were, but they, they also, they couldn't leave Thailand, but they also couldn't go back into Burma. And so um, I've just seen over the years, and then the United States under President Bush resettled um, tens of thousands of Burmese children. And so you, in these children, I mean, have gone on and have influenced so many communities where they were from. And we have a huge community of Burmese refugees here in Richmond, Virginia, where I live. And it's um, been neat to be, to go to their church and to, to see all the different ethnic groups um, within the Burmese. And it's just so enriching. And I, um, you know, over the years and now the Iraqi refugees. And I spent a lot of time in both Detroit and in San Diego, California with a lot of the Iraqi refugees and just learning and their stories and hearing from them. And these refugee communities, what I, I guess I'm always so fascinated by is they love their countries. They would love to be able to be free and to go back, but that's just not the reality for them, unfortunately. And until our foreign policy, is more focused on actually building long-term solutions in these countries where we address the root cause of the problem rather than just put band-aid solutions on it by you know resettling or uh, you know dealing with the the outcome of dictatorships these people will never be able to go home and for me that that's always made me so sad and then to hear stories or to hear comments about well about refugees that are so um that don't understand that these people literally fled for their lives because they, as whether it was whatever their faith was, they literally were being attacked for their very faith. They couldn't survive there. And if that was you, you would want somebody to stand up for you too. Um, that's not something we would want to wish on anyone. So that's what America was founded on this idea of religious freedom for all people and that we are going to defend it in the world. And the rest of the world looks to us as this beacon of freedom. Um, and then, you know, for the last four years, we've kind of gone dark on this. So tell me about in the last four years, how is how has it been for your work? I mean, how how has it been and with churches that want to bring in refugees, that want to help communities, the, the you know, the backlash, this idea of welcoming the stranger? What is what has been the fallout of this um, decrease of refugees from around the world? What, what is how is that? How have you seen that impacted? Yeah, so it, it's been a really challenging several years um, because I think, unfortunately, there has been this conflation of refugees with a national security threat. And so a lot of the executive orders that we saw coming out of the White House in 2017, 2018, and, and 2019 even uh, were orders around why we needed to exclude certain nationalities from coming into the U.S. Um, with you know extreme vetting and things, which weren't really making the process more secure or efficient. What it was doing was preventing certain individuals from coming. So for example, we had a woman who was recently married, um, this is six or seven years ago in Pakistan, um, but her husband was publishing Christian material on a website. And so he got found out and then he was um, brutally tortured and beaten um, by the local authorities. And so she, um, Aruj actually fled that situation, became a refugee um, and was resettled through World Relief to our Spokane, Washington office. And it wasn't after, until after she came here that she realized her husband was alive 
Um, he survived that beating and um, is now a refugee in Sri Lanka. Um, but because a lot of individuals from Pakistan uh, were not being processed, he's they've now been waiting over five years, um, I'm sorry, over four years to now be reunited. And so she, every day they actually talk on the phone and she said, we've been living more years apart than we have been together as a married couple. And she wrote this beautiful, um, I was interviewed by Christiane today where she talks about her story. And it's it's a beautiful story of how God brought them together. Um, and she prays for her husband every day. And this is a specific case we've been advocating for with the State Department and others. But this is just one example of an individual who for over four years has not been able to get in. Uh, there's another uh, Congolese family that we've been advocating for. Um, who one of uh, actually our staff members is Congolese and he's been waiting for his family to be resettled and it's been a couple years now and unfortunately his his family's flight was canceled a few times and so he talks about the grief of knowing the vulnerable situation his family is in and how they're not able to get in and so it really was a stark contrast I think in values because you have this program that has been staunchly supported by both Republicans and Democrats over many years. You mentioned George W. Bush resettling large numbers of Burmese refugees through the program. Even after 9-11, the program was never shut down because the president um, and the administration and the broader public never necessarily conflated refugees with terrorists. And so even right after 9-11, the program continued safely. Um, and it really wasn't until recently that, that unfortunately there has been this merging of this narrative um, which is a false narrative because it's not borne out in, in the reality of data or statistics, which really prevented many of these re refugees from being re reunited with their loved ones in the United States. And so not only do we see a decrease in the, the refugee ceiling, which the president has authorized every year and sign on the dotted line to say this is a number that we want to accept, but we saw that number decrease from um, 85,000 to 50,000 to 45,000 um, to 30,000 to 15,000, which is the current refugee ceiling that we have right now, which is the lowest ceiling set in the history of the U.S. refugee resettlement program. Um, and not only that, but uh, he, he changed the categories um, so that many vulnerable individuals like Syrian refugees and Iraqis basically couldn't come in through the program. Um, so we've worked to change that. I think there's a recommitment now with um, President Biden to not only raise the refugee ceiling, but to recategorize the program so that those who are most vulnerable can actually come in. So our expectation is that we will see more Congolese refugees like this, the staff member at World Belief, that we will see his family now coming into the program and that we'll hopefully see more Iraqi and Syrian refugees also coming into the program. Um, but again, I think it's important to remember that um, when this act was passed in the early 1980s, Ronald Reagan is the one who who processed over 100,000 refugees, mostly coming from Vietnam during his administration. And so there has been this bipartisan effort, this bipartisan support. And I think it's important that we keep this narrative alive for those who are vulnerable um, and to make sure that we preserve this for, for future refugees that are, are fleeing persecution. Yeah, when I worked on the Hill, I saw a lot of really interesting things. I think one of the things that frustrated me the most about the policies, um, and this was under numerous administrations, but so there was a, a program called the Lautenberg Amendment that allowed for persecuted um, groups from Iran, like Jewish communities, um, um, Ar Armenians, and some other group Baha'is from Iran that had established like legitimate persecution claims that we knew because of ongoing State Department reports, et cetera, that these people are never really safe in Iran. That there was this ongoing agreement with the government of Austria that that Austria would provide them a visa, they would go to Austria, and then in Austria the U.S. would process them and automatically, you know, put them in the in the process for refugee status. And so, um, I had met a woman, an Armenian Christian woman, whose uh, aunt or cousin I can't remember exactly was in the process, and then literally got stuck and was going to be sent back to Iran. And it's like, wait a minute, you can't send them back because one, diplomatically it would destroy everything that we had agreed on with Austria because they did this under you know, the belief that we were going to do, you know, um, you know, actually um, do our side of the bargain, which was process these individuals, not just leave them in Austria. But I mean, there were people that were disabled that had, um, that were waiting for family and they, and this, the entire financial burden is on these people when they're in Austria waiting to be processed. And so I remember working with um, 
just Republican and Democratic lawmakers to try to get Lautenberg reauthorized. Um, but what I understand, it, Lautenberg is not, it's not there anymore. Is that, pro, is that program now completely defunct? No, Lautenberg is there. Um, it has to be authorized by Congress every year. So we have to just make sure that it, it gets included in that. But um, but it has been challenging because um, the processing side of things has, has pretty much stalled, even though the program still exists. Um, and so we have to re-engage the administration to, to re-amp processing for these individuals to make sure people that are stuck um, and have fled Iran and are stuck right now in Austria are able to come in. Um, but actually one, one of the main, one of the first refugee families I met in Baltimore was uh, a Baha'i family who, so Baha'i is a, a religious belief um, and they're discriminated against in Iran. And so they came in through the Lautenberg program was resettled to Baltimore where I lived at that time. And I remember getting to know this family and they had two young boys and the parents. And um, I remember visiting with them weekly and they were so grateful to be here and they would talk about how terrible Iran was for their family, how the boys felt like they, they were not not able to get a, a further education because of their Baha'i beliefs, how the dad was discriminated against and can't find employment and all of these things. And um, I remember going to them every week and I took the boys to soccer games and it was a lot of fun. And the, the mom would always cook me these amazing meals. So um, she would cook me all this like Persian food and it was absolutely delicious. And I, I enter into these relationships oftentimes thinking, oh, I'm going to, you know, um, give them so much and tutor them and do all these things. But I feel like I received more of this relationship um, being in getting to know these refugees because not only did I have some of the best food I've ever had in my life, but I, I got to understand a, a part of this world that I never would have been exposed to through their stories. And it was incredible for me because later on, um, they actually opened up a restaurant in Baltimore. Wow. They've been giving back to their local community and uh, sharing their story. And it's, it's just this incredible story of, of this family that experienced such significant persecution and yet uh, came here and have become really contributing members of our community here. So um, it just, again, goes to show you that the refugee crisis is not just about the millions, it's about the one. And for us to enter into relationships, not because we have so much to give, but because we have so much to receive and having that sense of mutuality as we talk about refugees is, is really a, an important part of the conversation. And so, you know, you mentioned that, I mentioned that, and I think um, we have to think about that both at a communal level, but also at a um, policy level as well. Yeah, and so just another example of something that I had to deal with in Congress um, when we worked together on so many of these issues was uh, there was, I had traveled to Iraq many times uh, after the war started. And um, at one point I met an entire group of refugees that were there in Iraq from Iran. And they registered as refugees with the UN and they were never called up. There was no processing of their applications. And so I remember just interviewing each of them and trying to figure out, okay, what is going on here? And I ended up doing an entire investigation for when I was working for Congress on how on numerous cases, um, and I worked with a lot of the different refugee groups that were dealing with the same problem um, from, I think from like Indonesia, uh, Thailand, um, Turkey, Cyprus, Iraq. I mean, there were so many cases that we identified where the UN wasn't processing individuals that were converts to Christianity from Islam. Um, and oftentimes it was translators at the United Nations that were biased and we're misinterpreting information or not interpreting correctly. And often two things would happen. One, they would never get through the UN process. They would be never even, because that's the first line of defense people don't understand. You first have to go through the UN and be recognized as a refugee to even then get to a system where the US can, can consider you for admission. So it's a very lengthy process. And like you said, it, it often takes decades for people to get through it. But I found that that first barrier was a huge, there was a huge problem with the United Nations. So I remember meeting Antonio Guterres, who's now the head of the, <laughs> the, head of the UN. And he was at the, at the time, the head of the refugee office. And I remember being in a meeting with him and he was very upset at us for challenging him. And we cut the budget. I think it was like by 40% during one of the major things because they were being um, biased in their admissions of refugees. And we said, look, you need to deal with this. It's not okay 
to just not let people through because you have officers that are biased against particular groups, especially when religious persecution is the, one of the main five claims for a refugee status. So um, when the US Congress cut their funding, he took it very seriously. And very quickly, he was able to rectify the situation, begin to address some of those things. And in um, at least in all of the cases in Iraq, there were about 10 of the cases, they re, um, they re interviewed every single one of those cases and they got through and then they were being processed. But then they got to the United States admissions. And when they got to the United States admissions, um, one of the young men, when they had fled Iran and they came across the border into Iraq, they were in a uh, like a hotel or a building where they rented a room um, from a man that was associated with a communist group in Iran. Now, the funny thing is, I don't think people in the United States are probably too afraid of communists anymore <laughs> from the rhetoric around the United States politically, but um, the group was designated on the terrorism list, the communist group. And so because that refugee had fled persecution um, and then in his fleeing in Iraq had had um, rented a, a building from a group that was designated as a terrorist group, even though, I mean, he had no idea. He was literally going to sleep to, to, to flee for his life. Um, when he mentioned that in the interview, it triggered what we were referring to, which is the terrorism related inadmissibility grounds trig, which then automatically put a red flag on his, his application. And even though he had sponsors here in the United States, he was not allowed to ever come to the United States. And so him and his family um, were left in Iraq and eventually them and all of the other refugees that I mentioned ended up going across the border into Greece when, when um, the crisis happened. And um, we've seen the pictures and the images of what happened there. And it was, I mean, horrifying to see how many people died in just trying to escape for their lives and fleeing in boats. And I mean, it was horrific, but the, the trig really has negatively affected a lot of people that have been raped. I mean, you can mention, I'm sure several stories, but but that's been a huge hurdle to overcome and it's still a problem. I mean, can you share anything about that? Yeah, so you're, um, the, the trig bars that are really preventing a lot of refugees. I mean, so much of the refugee claim is tied up in the experience of being a victim of terrorism, like I was mentioning, but a lot of times, um, when they first instituted these bars, we had cases of women who were uh, enslaved by the military um, overseas in parts of Africa that were washing dishes for their um, their captors. And that activity was considered support of a terrorist organization. And that woman was barred from coming into the U.S. You're mentioning other Iraqis that were engaged in um, you know, civil activities related to um, the war there and were barred because of that activity. And so we still are dealing with these bars, um, terrorism related bars. Now they have a duress exception, which means that if you provided such support under duress, which means you had a gun to your head um, mm -hmm. and you you know, were forced to pay a, pay a ransom, for example, for your son to be released from the FARC in Colombia, that's another case we had that that's not considered um, payment in support of a terrorism group because you had to do it under duress. So we have an exception for that, but there's other, cases where um, there's groups of, you know, ethnic or religious minority groups in Burma that are engaged in, um, you know, community activities that are preserving their identity as an ethnic and religious minority who um, such activity is uh, considered part of um, terrorist activity. So the, the definition has become very broad. Uh, and so we are working to, to continue to change that because it has led to deserving refugees being barred from admission to the United States. But um, but again, I think um, you know, there's a lot that needs to change, not only on trig, but on gen general processing to ramp up processing for refugees, to continue to go to places where people are highly vulnerable and to uh, process them for admission to the United States. And so we're hoping that with a raised refugee ceiling, which is what President Biden had committed to, and also uh, and, um, a reform of the program that we'll see an increase in individuals like these who can come to the United States. But again, it is a, um, an uplift that we have to continue. To, it's a battle that we have to continue to, to fight on um, with members of Congress and the administration to make sure that that happens. Um, and so I think it's incumbent upon all of us, not just to ch continue sharing these stories, but to reach out to our members to let them know that we are supportive of this program as well. Yeah. And there are a lot of other policies that the advocacy groups have been trying to get Congress to look into, like 
like the idea of more um, local sponsorship of refugees, because this is something that like, for instance, the Canadian government does. I mean, a, a church or, an, or a, a group will sponsor and literally say we need, like we're willing to take four refugees and they can sponsor them. And so uh, one of the groups that I worked with in Iraq was able to eventually get into Canada because of that. Um, through sponsorship. And then the church actually shares a lot of the financial burden, because this is another issue that we often hear about, you know, the burden of the financial burden of refugee resettlement. And I think one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that the United States probably gives the least amount of aid of any country that I know of to refugees that come here. So can you just kind of like give us a quick summary? How what actually happens if somebody comes to the United States versus like another country? Yeah, so um, a couple of things. So this, the State Department is the government agency that runs the program. So they partner with organizations like World Relief. There's nine of us. Um, and so our job is to um, resettle the refugees uh, with a small amount of money we get from the State Department for the initial 30 days. Um, and then that is oftentimes matched by, our, by donations from the public that we get. Um, and so our job is to not only pick up the refugees at the airport and provide them with housing initially, uh, but to make sure that they get their social security numbers and um, their, their paperwork process so that they, and to help them find a job once they get here as well. Um, so that's why we really um, like to ask churches to partner with us in this journey so that they can come alongside these refugees and be their friends and help them through this process of integration. Um, but the refugees themselves get a little over a thousand dollars per refugee from the U.S. government, and then we help as an agency support them with housing and actually finding a job. Um, after the initial 30-day period, there's an eight-month period uh, in which they get some um, basic case management and services uh, for the refugees once they get here. Um, but again, that's only for eight months. It actually used to be a couple, a couple years back in the 1980s and 90s, but that actually was cut over the years. Um, and so now it's, it's really um, incumbent upon our partners to help provide some of the basic needs of refugees. So we we have seen a lot of churches make signs when they come out of the airport saying, welcome. And, uh, you know, they'll be the ones preparing the hot meal for them, which is required of us for that, for us to provide a hot meal for refugees as their first meal when they get here. And they'll be the ones setting up the apartment. But you're right. I think uh, there has been a commitment to exploring what community-based sponsorship could look like. Um, so Canada does have a model where they do private sponsorship. In the US, I think it's gonna be a little bit challenging because we don't have um, some of the free public um, ca uh, healthcare that, that Canada does. So there's more costs associated with, with that, but I think it's it's a model that we should be exploring um, just to see what, uh, whether churches and local communities can sponsor these individuals and really help them when they when they get here as well. So it's really important. Let me just recap. So it's $1,000 for literally the first thousand. Yeah. and then you're on your own pretty much and that's important to understand because if refugees that are resettled like in sweden or in france or germany i mean i i know refugees where it's like you get two years of of full-time like support you know you get your housing you get your health care you get i mean you are provided for for per, like literally at least two years in many other countries and here you literally it's 30 days and you're on your own and for many of these refugees that are children, that's why groups like World Relief, um, Catholic World Services, so many of these Catholic charities, I mean, you, you name it, so many of these groups are so important because they provide that ongoing support. It's actually not publicly funded. It's actually, actually most of it is privately funded and that's essential for them to, to assimilate and to uh, you know, be able to live on their own. Um, and I, I think, I think yeah, one one note that maybe maybe many people will not know is that refugees actually have to pay back the airplane tickets that they use to come here. So it's not even that they get tickets for free, actually. And when they pay back their airline tickets, it actually establishes their credit in the United States so that their credit can then be used for them to get a mortgage and buy a car and all these basic things. And so um, even that is not for free. So you're exactly right that it is a public private partnership. And that is one of the, the assets of, of this program. Well, and I think that's really important, Jenny, because when we had a gap in refugees for four years, so many of these charities that were supporting refugees, because there were no refugees coming in, they weren't getting the donations and the private support they needed to continue their services. So now 
many of them have had to cut, make enormous cuts. And so to ramp up, to be able to then um, be available for the refugees that are coming, but also the ongoing needs of all the refugees that are still here that need that ongoing support, I can imagine that was extremely hard. And so that's where the partnerships with churches and other groups has, I'm sure, been such a huge asset to all of you um, in this in this you know time. Yeah, and actually, over the past several years, we've seen more volunteers come out and want to help refugees. I think when they saw some of the executive orders limiting refugees from coming in, it, it compelled them to say, "No, that that's not what we stand for. We do not want any limits or or bans on certain nationalists from coming here." So we've it's seen increases in um, people giving to World Relief and volunteering with us, which has really been a great demonstration of people's public outpouring of support for refugees. Um, but I, I think, you know, the challenge remains for people to understand, well, how does this program work and who these refugees are? And um, in our experience, the, knowing and working with many of these refugees, not only are they grateful to be here, but they become business owners and entrepreneurs. They have amazing stories of contribution to America and um, and still connected to their home countries, but a real um, pride in being in the United States. And so, um, you know, I encourage anyone who is near a refugee resettlement office to get plugged in because I think it can be life changing. And I think, um, yeah, many of these refugees have have incredible stories to share. I've seen some really neat things happening here in Richmond, uh, Virginia, where I live with uh, different groups, Reestablish Richmond and others that are doing ongoing support to help refugees. And it's really encouraging to see how communities are coming together. But in your book, I mean, there was this 10 year gap between the initial and the, and the, um, when you republished it and so, or the updated edition. So in those 10 years, tell me what you saw happening, the changes happening in our country of just responses to refugees. Yeah, so when uh, Matt Sorens and I uh, both wrote, wrote the book together, we both work at World Relief, and in our work at World Relief, our job was to educate churches on why they should care about immigrants and refugees and really change the narrative, because when you look at polling data, what you'll find is that white evangelicals, more than any other group, even non-religious groups, are oftentimes seen as the most anti-immigrant, and so um, they're more likely to see immigrants as a drain on society and drain on public benefits. And so in our experience as an organization that serves refugees, we wanted to change that narrative. So a lot of the work we were doing in the beginning was sharing about the history of immigration to the U.S., about per immigrants' families that we have come to know, and about the politics of immigration. So we said, well, we're saying the same thing over and over again. We should just write a book together on it, which we did. Mm -hmm. And so that came out in 2009. This is right when President Obama and Senator McCain at that time were duking it out. And, uh, you know, their immigration was a hot topic back then. And over the 10 years uh, since we initially read that book, we've really seen a lot of change within the evangelical community, I would say specifically around immigration. I think there was a disconnect between um, the, the politics of immigration and the theology of migration. And I think we were able as an organization to challenge thousands of Christians in the, in the U.S. Over, over these years to actually connect their faith to this issue and to realize that actually how you treat the refugee and the, and the stranger is how you're going to treat Jesus himself. And, you know, you need to live out welcome out of your lives, out of your churches. You know, pastors need to preach about immigration from the pulpit, not as a political issue, but as a theological issue. You know, we need people starting English classes in their churches. We need immigrant legal services. We need all of these things to get people in relationships with people that are not like them. And so that has been the challenge. And we have seen really a sea change, I would say, in 10 years where very prominent, large evangelical churches are now at the front lines of serving their immigrant neighbors. Their pastors are, are preaching about immigration from the pulpit. We've seen sign on letters. We created a, um, we're part of creating a coalition called the Evangelical Immigration Table which now has about a dozen evangelical groups that are now advocating for immigration reform. That didn't happen you know, in 2009. And so th I think there has been this concerted, very powerful voice of evangelicals uh, coming together in support of immigrants. And it really has affected, I think not just the Christian public witness, but it has impacted how those from the outside see our Christian faith. And when you have a community of, of of believers who are saying, no, actually, when we talk about immigrants, we're talking about us. When immigrants who are really growing in large numbers in the church, where 
you know, the brown, the, the Latino, the Asian churches, the black churches in the U.S. are growing significantly. You know, they're leading the way for us to have these conversations to say, when we talk about this issue, we have to, because this is an issue impacting the church. This is not outside of the church. So all of that has been great. I, I mean, really, this conversation now is led by the immigrant church. It's led by dreamers. It's led by these people who have been personally impacted. And I think that's the way it should be. Um, but I think it's encouraging for all of us to understand that I think as we share our stories and as we humanize this very tough converse, this tough topic, and as we um, talk about the reality of, of um, what people go through, as well as the data around the economic and sec security angles of this, the, of this debate, that it, I think people will come around to see, okay, this is something that I can get behind yeah, I can use my voice to contact my elected officials and tell them that something needs to change. I think when we do that, we will continue to see changes for the, for the positive for immigrant neighbors and, um, and brothers and sisters. Yeah, and I've just been amazed over the years, the groups that I've worked with and seen, I mean, even just the churches that I've been a part of, they've always been very engaged in, like, for instance, Sudan and helping the Lost Boys. And this has just always been around me. So it's um, it's great to see that there's so many more people uh, becoming engaged in this conversation and wanting to welcome and host refugees and help them assimilate, help them, you know, just, I mean, they've lost everything. They've lost their families often. And so, you know, that's, that's, I think, a great witness, like you're sharing, um, it, you know, of the greatness of what it means to be an American too, that, that that's how we were founded, that we embrace people and um, want them to find freedom and dignity and that's, we should exemplify that. Um, one of the stories that I think we can, I just wanna share before we go is, I remember being in Iraq with these refugees that I was helping who had been totally ignored by the UN. And, and I, I told them, okay, well, I'm gonna figure this out. We're gonna make sure you, know, you get processed. And so when they finally did end up going through those UN interviews and getting that status, which is essential because as you know, they were illegal in their country of where they're at, where they're refugees until they actually have a UN stamp that says I'm a refugee. So it's horrifying. They can't do anything. They can't get paperwork. They can't own anything. They can't get married. I mean, there's, they are literally illegal in the country and as refugees until they have the UN acknowledge that yes, you are a legitimate refugee for religious persecution or some other reason. And so when they finally did that, they said, you know, Tina, um, and everybody knows the story of Iraq and how, you know, after the Iraq war, so many Christian communities and other minority communities were just brutally targeted by terrorists and um, really caught in the middle of the Sunni Shia conflict there um, and fleeing the country. So it was just a very difficult time for a lot of these uh, persecuted minorities, communities. And I remember him saying, you know, there's a lot of groups that come here um, and they, they want to, um, the, so this young man was a translator. So he would go and help the groups that came in from the United States go and translate for them on their their missions or their humanitarian trips, whatever it was. And then, you know, they take a picture, they leave, they come back to the United States, and they would forget him. And he said, you are the first person that came here that didn't just take a picture with me and leave and forget us. Did you actually remembered us and you did something to help us? And I just remember being so um, just sad that that I was the first one. Because I think, um, you know, being a Christian myself, that, you know, that that's not like that we shouldn't be the first ones that actually show care or follow through. I don't just go on trips around the world to take a picture with somebody and say I was here and post it, you know, on social media um, and treat people as museum pieces. I just, I feel so sad that that's kind of something that's happened in our culture, that these are real human beings that are suffering, that just want to be able to get married, have a job, get a car, be able to provide for their families. And even when they're stuck in other countries, it's not even about coming here for them necessarily. They just want to live dignified lives um, and they don't want to live under persecution. And so how can we walk alongside them and help them in any way, um, big or small, whether that's when they're in those, in those um, countries that they fled to or in the, they're in the United States, and so that's really, for me, what motivates and inspires me is I just want people to live with dignity and mm -hmm. we want to help them there. We want to help them here. Um, but, but I think that that reflects more about who we are and our faith um, and our testament that, you know, our beliefs live through in everything that we do. 
uh, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of who they are, what they believe, I want them to know that, um, that I think that they deserve dignity and freedom. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's so beautiful. And I think you're exactly right to capture um, what I think our responsibility is, I, our more responsibility to show compassion and to have empathy towards those who oftentimes have experienced things that we would never imagine. And I think it, it speaks to the fact that many of these individuals have gone through a lot and yet are still hopeful through it all. And through their suffering, they actually become stronger and can teach us so much about what it means to be resilient. And so again, I think we have so much to learn from these individuals. I think it, what it requires is for us to um, put ourselves in their shoes, but also um, also reimagine what welcome could look like. Cause I think it, it involves all of us. Yeah, the way of ending it. Imagine what welcome can look like. Mm -hmm. Jenny, thank you so much. It was so great reconnecting with you and, and being able to share your story. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Tina. I, I love talking with you and catching up.